um, so excited to have you here for this interactive conversation around innovation. Um, we've been talking a lot about that word for the past uh, 36 hours. And this session is particularly going to focus on um, a couple different concepts within this overall topic about when you dive into the details of building an innovative culture within City Hall, um, what are the things that actually work? What conditions does it take to build a culture within City Hall in which they feel empowered to implement bold solutions? Um, so today, um, we are going to talk about the merits of two different concepts in particular, labs, innovation labs. Um, and for today, we're gonna talk about innovation teams as well in the same context of a lab, meaning a team of innovation um, experts or practitioners who are dedicated capacity within City Hall to work on these issues. Um, so we'll talk about this labs teams concept versus systems change approach, which in the um, nerd world of innovation um, conversations is a, a hot topic. So we're gonna debate the merits of those different approaches and we're gonna do that with our illustrious panel here who I'm going to introduce to you. Mayor Ethan Berkowitz, um, he's the mayor of Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, Marjolena Rinkineva, I'm, I'm gonna learn Finnish, it's gonna happen. Um, she is the director of economic development from Helsinki. We have Sylvine Boachosi, who is um, a partner with Bloomberg Philanthropies on the um, La 27 region. It's a, an innovation effort here in France um, for city and local governments. Um, and Perrette Tonorist, who is an OECD systems change expert. So that's what we're gonna talk about. We're, there, we're gonna have a quick introduction to these two okay. concepts in innovation, just to make sure that we're all speaking at least the same language. Um, then we're gonna move into two rounds of debates. We're gonna have Mayor Berkowitz and Marjolena talk about one topic. They're gonna go back and forth in one minute rounds with each other, and I'm gonna be a stickler on time, so I get to be the mean cop in this, uh, in this situation. And then everybody's John, John gonna- Gendarme, <laughs> that's <cop. laughs> this, this, Thank you, uh, merci. Um, then we'll have a discussion amongst all of us. What did you think about that conversation? What struck you as interesting or things that you'd like to add to the conversation? We'll do a second round of debate with Sylvine and Perrette. And then you're gonna get a chance to um, take what you've heard and push it forward. Um, there's gonna be some worksheets and you get to do a little interaction with people at your table and we'll talk about that when we get there. So it's gonna be a fast hour and we're really excited to have you um, contribute to the conversation along the way. <coughs> so very quickly, as I mentioned, um, we're gonna talk about this lab and iTeams concept um, very, very briefly. At uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, we have a program, the Innovation Team Program, that's um, something that I lead. And we have teams, 24 teams around the world who are embedded in City Hall to build the capacity of that government to interact with citizens um, and to break down silos across City Hall to really deeply understand these complex problems that cities are facing and come up with innovative ideas to that. We have some other I-team directors with us today I wanna acknowledge. Um, we have uh, uh, Itai Aegis from Tel Aviv, Sharon from Jerusalem, we have Amanda from LA, Brendan from Anchorage. Am I missing anyone? Dunkirk, thank you. And I think that's that. Um, so uh, Sylvine, who's gonna talk about labs um, and their version is someone we're partnered with for the four cities in France. And she is helping to lead that effort here in France. So she's gonna take it from me and talk quickly about this labs iTeam concept. Mm -hmm. um, and Sylvine. Thank you. Um, so maybe as a very quick introduction, why create labs? Uh, the road is often paved with questions, if not difficulties, so you need to have good reasons from the beginning to start with. Um, so more and more local government face uh, crisis of effectiveness of public policies and failure of public uh, institutions to tackle and build concrete solutions to complex challenges such as uh, poverty, urban revitalization, so often cross-sectoral uh, problems that, are that they can't tackle directly with their administration. Uh, we can also observe uh, a current democratic and representation crisis uh, and the need to bring public administration closer to users. And maybe another good reason 
uh, would be that we can observe a management crisis within public administration. We see that public agents uh, are also t uh, more and more tired of uh, not being able to answer, to connect to users, um, and to face also uh, incentive to innovation uh, in silos, meaning uh, on technology, on certain sectors, but not something cross-sectorial. Uh, so very often, a lab come also as new narrative to bring an holistic change within a public administration. Um, it's not such a surprise to have experimental methodology uh, being embraced by public administration since they all are already adopted uh, in industrial in industries, etc. Uh, nevertheless, unlike enterprises, administration are more designed to administrate than to innovate. So lab also represent an attempt from public administration to take risk uh, and to develop their own R and D capacity. Uh, it's also an attempt to re-internalize collective intelligence and to say that we have the capacity also to change ourselves and to develop new approaches. Um, we can also mention that uh, if labs are more and more developed, there's also initiatives to change administration that goes beyond labs. So we have good examples with Helsinki or with Nantes that didn't develop a lab but nevertheless are innovating and changing themselves. Uh, maybe we can change. Um, last um, information in that labs very quickly. Uh, it is not something new. It is really a global movement. So you can see in this um, map uh, that it was designed by NASTA, British organization, that there's about 100 um, innovation labs or innovation initiative within public government growing currently. There's 60 uh, in Europe. Uh, so it's really a growing um, uh, world. Um, and also a community of practice. There's more and more uh, exchange of methodologies, exchange of practice, and iTeam is one of the um, several initiatives that are also uh, designed to uh, build a peer-to-peer -peer exchange and no knowledge exchange. Um, there are, of course, different type of labs. Uh, um, they differ in type of governance, uh, in scope, in financing, in maturity, in types of organization. Uh, so some are um, within national government, some are in local government, like in I-Team, some are fi financed only by uh, uh, public funding, some are more and more uh, mixed funding of uh, local uh, foundations um, or international foundations such as uh, Bloomberg. Um, some are um, focused on empowering and developing new capacity for the administration. Some focus also more on bringing new solutions directly for the citizens. Uh, some are very new and just starting, but some have been existing for 15 years, such as the MindLab. Um, so just a couple of words about MindLab, just as an example. Uh, it's a cross-governmental unit. Uh, it's part of three ministries. Uh, in Denmark uh, from industry, business, employment, education, and one mis municipality, so it's very uh, cross-level. Um, some are um, very uh, focused on uh, research, like the Parson Desis Lab in New York, uh, and some are very topical, like La Fabrique de l'Hospitalité in France, which is really fo focusing on hospitals and health system. Great. Thank you. And Mayor Berkowitz, um, as someone who is a uh, mayor operating with an I-team in this city, is going to uh, provide a little bit more insight about what that's like on the ground. Well, thank you all for coming to listen to us today. I'm going to begin by speaking in praise of impatience. We live in a dynamic world, and if we're not innovating, then we're stagnating. Unfortunately, government is primarily designed to manage problems, not particularly to solve them, not particularly to look for opportunities. So one of the reasons why it was important for us to get an innovation team, an innovation leader in place was so we could change that dynamic, so we could start to look around corners, so we could start to solve long-term problems, but also to look for opportunities that, that we might not have had uh, in, in the past. Government, when you think about it, is pretty stodgy. It's very rigid. Uh, it, it is risk averse. 
I don't know how you can succeed in today's incredibly changing world if you're not evolving along with it. So the, the focus we had on putting together an innovation team, even before we had the support of Bloomberg, um, but we're very grateful for <laughs> that, <laughs> is that we wanted to change the culture inside the city so that we created entrepreneurs uh, from the, the people that work for the city. Because the, those who are working in government know best about what changes need to take place. But because they operate in what's an inherently risk-averse uh, environment, we needed to change that. And so our I team, first, the most important thing they do is spearhead a cultural change inside city government, making risk acceptable, making thought acceptable, making change acceptable. And they've done a terrific job at that. But they've also ha done done things where they have solved specific problems. We've done, in, in just the short time that we've been stood up as an I-team, we've done behavioral insights that have helped us wring additional monies out of the fine and fee collection that we wouldn't have done in the past. Um, we were doing things with job creation and facilitating job searches for people. There are all kinds of possibilities. And as the other government employees see what we're doing at the, at, with the I-team, they're encouraged to come forward, and they have been coming forward with ideas about how to reform their own departments. The admonition that I gave the I-team, that I gave Brendan Babb when he first got started, I said, take me out past where I can see. Because we cannot stand still right now. So what I would like to really emphasize is that there's a certain physics to change, that we will be stuck with inertia unless we generate momentum. And the I-team generates momentum. It, cre it creates a time and space for public employees to think, to innovate, <laughs> to create change, to do their jobs with greater efficiency and also with greater satisfaction. And that's a, a critical piece moving ahead. Th the final piece I'd like to say about the I-team is what I really appreciate about what they're doing is not just an I team, it's a go team. It's not just about ideas, it's about actions. Fabulous, thank you, Mary. Um, and Corette is gonna be talking to us a little bit about systems change and what that means um, in, in the debate that's been going on in the innovation conversation. Exactly, so I'm from the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation from the OECD and we are leading one of the streams of work uh, is on system change and system thinking. So the main idea coming at the moment that we are all having this uh, frustration and anxiety con connected to government and, and we don't know what actually is going on. So we come from the um, perspective that systems are, public systems are actually not failing. They are functioning. They're functioning for the systems that they were actually created for, for the world that they were created for. So mostly, most of the government systems were created in the world of uh, beginning of the 20th century or even uh, or middle of the 1950s. So they are working for the nuclear families to the kind of the type of uh, way humans and people uh, seem to live before. But they don't work for the type of lives that we live today, the way we are uh, consuming services today, the way we are uh, living our lives. So for example, I, d I don't have a nuclear family, I don't have children, but uh, I have a cat and I have a se partner for seven years who doesn't live in the same country as me. We have uh, homes in three countries all over Europe. So we are constantly in struggle with the systems within uh, actually four different countries in Europe um, in terms of what services or what kind of uh, tax solutions or what kind of uh, you know, um, uh, solutions we are need to have for a family and in many cases we don't go to government at all anymore so we just uh, you know co go for private uh, providers or civic uh, organizations to actually get what we need so my relevance my interaction with government even in, uh, when i'm studying government has diminished because the needs that i have today are not responded by government itself so the fear is that government is becoming irrelevant because it's not updating systematically for the needs of the you know, complex needs that we are facing today. Yes. <coughs> so the work that we are doing is actually looking into the practice of over 70, 80 years. So the system thinking has been around for such a long time. So that there are many techniques and solutions to actually look at how complex problems interact, 
how complex problems are connected to various um, various ways and solutions that we are not discre discreetly you know dealing with one issue or another so yesterday we had um, a great pan a panel discussion on the main stage on uh, upward mobility and the american dream the hope that it creates actually the system and there are five fact factors that were outlined uh, in that panel so if we discreetly only address one of the most correlative actors family stability then i presume that the the outcome, even if you if you do and you put all your money and power into the kind of approaching family stability and the factors that are connected to it, for example, economic development, job security, all things that lead to divorce or all things that lead to family security, then we are still not going to actually reach the purpose or the outcome that we want, that children today can have the mobility, upward mobility or the possibility of upward mobility that they need because we are not addressing all the factors systematically because they uh, outside of the family kids co uh, contact with uh, come to contact with many many different things and if you don't look at the problem systematically you're at some point going to end in failure so actually we are dealing with how to do it so most of our analysis at the observatory are working together with different governments is actually how to frame problems, how to look at problems in a way that all the systematic factors, or at least some that we can canvas, come forward. And we can frame the problem in terms of public value and public good in a way that we actually reach the purpose and iteratively do it again and again to actually get there. And this is not a uh, very simple process. It is damn hard. So be careful, you know, I if you know already what's wrong and it's easy and discreet, you don't have to do system thinking. But if you know that it's a complex, difficult issue, then this is might be a methodology for you. So we have looked at uh, recently in different cities around the world uh, different practices connected to uh, both um, disappearance of jobs, um, citizen uh, trust in government, uh, uh, citizen empowerment uh, in uh, democratic processes, um, different IoT, uh, circular economy, technology-led <coughs> smart city solutions and actually how, what systematic problems come forward. So this is a report that is coming, a preliminary version is coming uh, out in about two, three weeks, depending on how much time I have to write. <laughs> so thank you very much. Great, thank you. <coughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, the fun really begins now. Um, you all notice that there are giant green thumbs in front of you at your, at your place. Um, we're going to do, we're going to start our first round of debate with Mayor Berkowitz and Marjolena. <coughs> and um, they're going to each get these one minute banters back and forth three times in a row, six minutes total. Um, at the end of this, we're going to ask the audience, we're going to ask you all, so we need you to listen um, and think, uh, what do you agree with, right? Green thumbs up. We're going to ask you to each to kind of um, uh, provide your feedback to us, and then we'll discuss as a group. So um, keep thinking about what you want to use your thumb for. I'll ask you at the end. And we're going to start off with these one-minute rounds. And again, I'm going to be the mean timekeeper. There'll be a little song you'll hear. Um, this is the sound. All right, that's when they're up. And we'll go back and forth. Um, it keeps it happy. Uh, and the first question that they're going to talk about, um, uh, this kind of taking one stance and, and debating back and forth is the best way to build innovation is to start with a lab, yes or no? So Mayor Berkowitz, if you'll please get us started with our first minute round. Okay, those green thumbs only point one direction. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most important thing to do is just start. And we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You, you, if you want innovation, you need to take the risk to be an innovator. Ultimately, I would hope that you'd evolve to the point where you had an I team in place where you had that institutional structure, but it is really critical to just begin. Take that first step. Take a risk. Great. Marjolina. Uh, well, I don't know if this, this is going to be a debate because I agree to everything <laughs> you <laughs> said. But uh, still, um, we in Helsinki, we took, um, I would say about uh, 10 years ago, we took a very holistic, systematic approach to to innovation about in really involving people and how we did that is by really opening up the city opening up all our data and why i say that this becomes innovation it becomes innovation when you open up your data not only the civil servants have access to information 
but all our 600,000 residents have access to information. And by that, we take in use all the resources of our residents to really to come up with us to innovate, not, to not that the city becomes uh, not only producing services, but really co-creating and co-developing services together with our people. Excellent. Perfect. Mayor Berkowitz, what do you have to say <laughs> about that? I think that the whole notion of, uh, of fostering civic engagement and getting the public involved is a critical piece of making sure that you have a dynamic community. One of the things that's really important today where the world <coughs> is so big and national governments seem increasingly disconnected from local government and there's a sense of alienation among the public, the more people feel that they're part of a community that their voice matters, the better off it is. So the open data is, is a critical piece of, of civic engagement. Um, I think that's good for now. Great. Uh, are you okay with your timing? Good, yeah, <laughs> you guys are all coming in just under a minute, perfect. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, well, if we think about um, adding on to this um, opening data, uh, we have a very inspiring new strategy. We have a new mayor who started in, uh, in, in the beginning of June, and we have a new, new city strategy. And, it, and the sort of like the bottom line in that is that um, we consider the whole city as a, as a platform, that we really want, this again, opening up the city, that we want to open up all our services for, for testing and, and piloting. So it's not only about uh, that we have certain teams that who are working on the innovation, but we, we are really asking and inviting everybody to come along and, and, and use the city, our education, our healthcare system, infrastructure for testing and, and really creating uh, new. It, it's ultimately really critical to institutionalize innovation, make sure that innovation is a self-sustaining character trait of your community. And that can be done in ways that are particular to each community that reflect each community's identity. There's some general rules that I, I would think would transcend uh, across cities and states and countries. And the, the more that people see success, the more they will trust the innovation. And it is particularly critical once innovation, an I team gets going and it gets stood up, that you achieve success, visible successes early, publicize that. That will attract more attention and more support. Um, one thing I would like to bring into this discussion also is that we have sort of a like a not all, not banned, but almost banned the word innovation, because that has a, it's a remote word to our people. So we like to talk about designing cities and, and really bring, bring in design thinking, because in design is all about people. It's a, it's a human oriented, putting the person in the core and really thinking about that, that what, I, what does it do, do to your yourself and your, your the, the people in your, your city. And therefore we are in, and of course, coming from Finland, we always talk about design, that's in our DNA. But also, uh, so that's kind of a, because I mean, it, it matters that how you phrase and how you invite people in. And, and so therefore, uh, even though I, I totally agree everything about the I teams and what they are doing and what they are bringing to the city halls, dynamics, energy and all that, then and how do you really talk to your people? Excellent. Okay, okay. Round, round, of <laughs> a round of applause for that first round of debate. Thank you. So um, we're going to, uh, you know, listening to this great conversation here, we're going to kind of uh, repolarize it a little bit. So uh, there was a lot of agreement, which we, we thought might happen, but uh, Mayor Berkowitz's <laughs> kind of main message was get started. Um, it doesn't really matter what you do, um, but to start doing, bringing innovation in. Um, but his, his point is that institutionalizing innovation within City Hall um, and starting to show quick wins can build trust with the community um, that can build the momentum that you need to um, start changing culture overall. So thumbs up if there's agreement on that. All right. All right. <laughs> 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 of course, Itai, thank you, sideways, <laughs> um, And Margelena um, was talking about um, using the city as a, a broad, starting with the city as a broad platform for innovation and change, and, and opening up data, building transparency, um, and focusing on design um, across 
this large um, culture, which again is a bit different from some of other cities around the world, as she mo mentioned, but um, kind of taking this holistic approach at the start. Thumbs up, anyone? Yeah. All right, <laughs> all right, <laughs> great. So um, let's hear from you. We have a little bit of incentive to bring you into the conversation. Tell us what you agree, dif agree with, disagree with, um, comments that you wanna pick up on, maybe ask more questions. Um, the first 10 people who want to contribute to this conversation <laughs> will get some Anchorage Innovation Team swag. <laughs> so if that helps you get in, Brendan <laughs> will hand it out to you as you um, bring yourselves into this debate. But who would like to, do we have a mi handheld mic? Uh, we'll just have to uh, stand up, please. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll just repeat your question or comment. Um, yes, yes. And tell us who you are, although I know who you are. Hello. Did everybody hear this? Yeah, from Athens Municipality. My name is Maria Zepu. I have a question that has to do with the funding of innovation, mm -hmm. which comes in contradiction, let's say, with municipalities that are conservative with the way they're going to spend their money. They cannot p experiment, they cannot pilot stuff with taxpayers' money. Um, so what is the natural source then for innovation to be funded by if municipalities cannot do it. Even for those models that actually work, innovative models that work, municipalities will not take the lead and repeat them with their own uh, funds, their own budget. It's a great question. Does anybody on the panel want to take that? Marjolaine? <coughs> yeah, um, a very good, good question. And always work, you know, dealing with uh, taxpayers' money, you have to be really careful where you spend it. Uh, we have uh, in, in Helsinki. We are using a uh, little bit of the of the taxpayers' money. We have a some called innovation fund that we can people can uh, well the you know the, the our uh, stakeholders can apply for for some funding for for the experimenting. But also when when I was talking about opening the, the city and and inviting uh, our stakeholders and companies to to work with us, then the funding comes from those sources. And one more thing I, I would like to add here, you're coming from the Athens, of course, there is some EU funding also available for building these kind of platforms. Well, I wish we qualified for EU funding. <laughs> <laughs> Our flags are very similar, actually, <laughs> oddly enough. We initially funded based on existing budgets, but we've been able to not only solicit grants, but Moving ahead, there are savings that have been generated through the I-Team, and those savings and also increased revenues can be sources of additional funds. Uh, I mean, in, in particular, uh, the, the one example we had, we did a behavioral insights. We had, Anchorage has a budget of about $500 million. We had about 30 to $40 million of uncollected fees and fines. We've been sending out these very stagnant, scary letters that people ignore. Um, based on behavioral insights, we changed the letter. We generated an extra million dollars plus hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people mm -hmm. signed up for payment plans that hadn't happened in the past. And that by itself would be more than enough to pay for our IT. So being real quick um, and then we'll take another question. Just maybe to build on it, two type of answers. One is um, on the cost of not innovating. And what we can observe also is not in non-innovation is costful in terms of uh, public agent turnover, in terms of longer decision process, in terms of public policies that fail uh, because they were not tested beforehand, uh, in terms of public policies that don't meet their aims. So that's one thing. And second thing, what we observe for from our, our perspective is also that often having a mixed type of financing provides also a better governance and means that you can be more experimental because you have multiple funders. So that's not a solution indeed, but that's just uh, to add to the discussion. Great. Down here, and then I know you had a question. Oh, you have the mic, so excuse me. He, we're gonna go here and then uh, there. Uh, Eduardo Santana from Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, well, when I first saw the question, I thought that you start with a problem, actually, uh, with trying to resolve a problem that uh, necessity is the mother of invention for an old. Uh, so my, my question has to do 
with how do you approach a problem? How do you frame it? How do you deconstruct it in order to be able to innovate, to resolve it? Because ultimately, the whole reason to innovate is to resolve a problem. Mm. You want to do it? Well, this is kind of, um, you know, wine to my table. So this is uh, what we're actually discussing most on uh, how to frame problems in a, in a way that it, uh, in especially when it comes to complex problems that you take into account all angles. So you won't go to the quick wins and low hanging fruit uh, coming, coming from there. You want to have a, that's oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so indeed how to do it in a sense that uh, the problem I think in the public sector today is that we all think that uh, we are experts, we know everything. So we don't bring in the multitude of uh, perspectives. So we have a saying within our team that if you know everybody behind the table, you're going to fail. Because you literally do not have the perspectives of the people uh, that you're trying to influence. So bring in a diverse group of people from uh, various professional backgrounds of uh, various perspectives specific perspectives, also the target group behind the table, and then start to take into part uh, the problem itself. And how to have this conversation is extremely important because you, want, you don't want to be the kind of the ta typical town hall meeting type of uh, framing issues because you tend to get only complaints and, uh, and problems. Then also how do you frame the question or to these interdisciplinary kind of uh, communities is also kind of the critical factor in how to actually do it. So we see very different ways on, uh, for example, citizen assembly panels that are been popping up in Canada, for example, that we have looked at that work on complex issues, for example, for six, seven Saturdays out of their own uh, citizens, six, seven Saturdays in a row out of their own uh, personal time for free to actually go deep into a problem and, and the context that uh, they're working with. So uh, indeed, a lot of work has gone into it. Yeah, and uh, you know this the notion of the innovation team approach is about bringing in the dedicated capacity to understand that problem in a different way, um, and that in government we sometimes get entrenched in what we think the problem is um, in the city, and we've been dealing it with it for so long um, that it's nice to bring in a diverse background to think about a systemic approach mm -hmm. to understanding mm -hmm. the ecosystem that the problem is, uh, is is situated in, and and thinking differently and understanding it differently to try to uncover and unlock some some new opportunities. Um, down here, and then okay, and then we'll come back over here. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so innovation is a complicated word, right? And, and it's often understood in many different, but I think the most aspirational part of it is better. Mm. <coughs> uh, but at the same time, it could be an exclusionary concept, where at times like people at lower levels and ministries and agencies can think, well, I'm not the innovator. So I'm just wondering for those of you who are running bureaucracies, how do we actually cultivate the the behavior of constant improvement at all levels of agencies without them having to be innovation teams, but actually how do we drive mm -hmm. user-centered thinking or, or, you know, rapid iteration at the, you know, the EMTs or whoever without them needing to be a part of the innovation program? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sylvie? Yeah, maybe I'll hear one <coughs> of things. Um, uh, maybe I can uh, say a few words about the specificity of our approach in La Transfer in France, is that we don't start with building an innovation team, but for 18 months before the lab, uh, we work with a team of designers, sociologists, etc., uh, and with 20 public agents from the administration. So. Uh, they come from all levels in the hierarchy and from as many departments as possible. And the idea is that for uh, 18 months, several days per month, they will work together with our team and experiment new ways of working together. And they, were al they will also simulate the innovation lab. And the idea is that you don't create an innovation lab like a new department, but maybe you can also create a context that means that people will change the way they work, more cross-cutting. They will also realize the complementarity between the different approaches. And last but not least, they will also have a posture and a way of thinking that allows them to embrace and to make choices that may be uh, embracing more bold innovation and taking more risk. And so maybe that allows to have also a more sustainable approach. Marjolaine, 
Mayor Berkowitz, and we'll go in a little more question. Yeah, uh, excellent question, and that's something that I was trying to also say, that we tend like to talk about more about really design services to our people and not innovating or bring them into, into innovating. We have a, actually, we have this kind of a, it's called a 3D model today. Um, it's, a, it's not about the 3D model about the, the city infrastructure or that, but it's, a, it's about dialogue, digitalization, and design. And none of these is enough as it s uh, by standing alone. But when you bring these all together, you really have the, you, you're really discussing and listening to your people, you use digitalization and you use design thinking, the design methods, bringing all these th 3Ds together, then that's, that's kind of the way that we are now working with all the departments within the uh, city of Helsinki. It's fundamentally a question of leadership, not management. You gotta give credit, give credit all the time, take blame personally, um, and do whatever you can to increase morale and things will occur organically then. Great, okay, one more question and then we're gonna move to the next debate topic. Uh, I'm sorry, I promised you that you could speak, sorry. Uh, just go ahead and speak, I'm not sure where the mic is. All right, hi, thank you. Um, <laughs> Preston, thanks, <laughs> he's turned into our de facto <laughs> mic runner. Hi, I'm uh, Monica Molskat from uh, the Danish Design Center in Copenhagen. And um, I was wondering, we see a Dani like for Danish companies and global companies a way that they are setting up X Labs also to complement the innovation teams and innovation labs within the companies. So what do you think about um, copying or, or using this form of, of working with X Labs within the public sector innovation? What do you think about this and which strengths could you see from this? Thank you. This is nothing new. I mean, people have been solving problems for a long time. There's, uh, there's something called the Skunk Works. I don't know if people remember the Skunk Works. Uh, McDonald, I think it was McDonald Douglas put them together. And you put a, a, a group of critical thinkers in a confined space. You close the door. You tell them to solve a problem. And that's what we need to do more often. We need to give people that time, space, and, and, and uh, opportunity to address problems and encourage them to do that. We can't be afraid of doing things differently. Fundamentally, that's the, the basic nature of the challenge we have. Is people need to be more afraid of the status quo than they are of change, and we need to motivate them accordingly. Yeah, it's really interesting, and I'm going to let Perret put another comment in on this, but um, this notion that, um, that the innovation team is operating and then there's this secondary capacity is something that, um, you know, when these innovation teams come into government, there's so many fundamental changes that they find themselves making in an incremental innovation um, because someone hasn't been there kind of fixing some of those holes all along. And that there's somewhat of an impatience, as the mayor brought up in the beginning, to, to get to that bolder, more how do we rethink the notion of what government is and what it can do and redefining it, that these teams have a hard time getting to because they're trying to fix the foundational elements before the city is ready to get there. And that there's this new capacity brought in, a kind of like an innovation lab was meant to be in the beginning, um, to say we're going to actually start focusing on a bit more of the bolder things, some of those moonshot things. Um, and I think it's an interesting concept that is speaking to what we're actually starting to see unfold in the innovation labs and innovation teams approach over time. So great question. Pirette has one more comment, okay. then Marjolaine can get one more thing <laughs> and then we're going to go to the next debate. So indeed I think the question here is uh, inside or outside. That's the question. And I think that we practice with the exactly what you said, that inside the public sector, as in big organizations and firms uh, who deal with innovation, is that the current structures, institutions, bureaucracies start to kill off radical ideas. Mm -hmm. And that also happens to mm -hmm. iTeams and iTeams innovation labs within government. So these tools are mostly useful for radical innovation outside of government, to take it further away to take the kind of radical ideas, to cement a little bit, to bubble up a little bit, to become more mature before you take it back in. So different types of labs, different structures of labs, but different things. Marjolaine, last yeah, yeah, comment. Yeah, very, very, very shortly on this. I think there are many similarities because in, if you think about design thinking in, in the companies, uh, it's about listening to your clients. And in the cities, it's about listening to your residents. So many similarities there. Great. Okay, next round. Thank you, everybody. Um, Sylvine and Perrette are going to start with this prompt and um, do the one-minute rounds back and forth. 
So um, the prompt is that labs fail when they do not take a systems change approach. Yes or no? Sylvie. Um, so uh, maybe the question can be also why uh, do we need to embed innovation within the DNA of our city? Uh, I've presented very quickly the um, uh, specificity or, or of our approach. Uh, so it's all connected to internalizing collective intelligence, uh, bringing new innovation capacity deeply into the administration. What do we mean by innovation capacity? We mean creativity, we need, we mean user center approach, but we need also new ways of working together, new forms of management, less hierarchical, less wor working in silos, etc. And we need also new uh, forms of exert, ultimately of exercising the political power. So all of this for innovation to be sustainable is also uh, necessary. And maybe a last comment also for uh, public innovation to be sustainable, we also need to build an ecosystem. Great, oh. just in the buzzer, build an <laughs> ecosystem. <laughs> Great, go ahead. So I think the really question is what is success and what is failure? So I mean, uh, uh, for example, that's what I want to refute <coughs> from the get-go that if an innovation lab is put uh, closed down, this is not a sign of failure. So, you know, success can be that you become irrelevant, that innovation labs, you know, have uh, uh, diffused uh, innovation capacity and capabilities within cities uh, so far that, you know, they have become uh, unnecessary to even have them. But my, I think my structural with the systems comment up there is to the fact that where actually these innovations are, uh, innovation labs are put and how they are run really determines what they do and what kind of problems they deal with. So iLabs uh, solution, for example, uh, brings forward a, a certain type of innovations that they deal with and that they don't deal with other types of innovations. And I will continue on with the uh, next round. <laughs> <laughs> Great, good timing. <laughs> Sylvine, back to you. Um, so maybe on methods, um, um, I think from our approach, um, we try to design an innovation lab that uh, f fits the administration where it's embedded. Uh, a lot of labs uh, at certain point question themselves and how they can um, uh, be successful if they become too institutionalized. How can they be uh, successful is if they become too marginalized? So maybe the idea is also uh, to have um, innovation labs that is totally fitted. So it means that it will uh, use a different type of method, so maybe use data management when it's uh, necessary, maybe use design when it's necessary, and also to broaden up the type of profiles that are within the administration. We tend to have a lot of administrative and planning profiles, but how can we add more creative profiles? How can we add uh, maybe artists, uh, scientists, etc.? So how can we diversify? Great. Mm -hmm. So multidisciplinarity of teams is uh, exceptional. I mean, I, I can't argue against that. But in terms of if you have innovation labs just below the mayor or, or you put together teams that are very centered on data or, or behavioral economics, then they start to produce solutions that are connected to these fields. So if you don't con uh, connect these methods or, or you're focused on new methods per se and you don't deal with problems, then you end up uh, with uh, every uh, kind of uh, uh, every problem uh, looking like a nail because you have a hammer. Mm -hmm. And being exactly on below the mayor or having the political clout is a good thing that you know the mayor can always pick up the phone and call the department and say, "Do it." But on the other side, it also brings a little bit of a downside to the problem as well because uh, innovation teams tend to concentrate on things that look good on the media. So mm -hmm. bring demonstrable results because they are in this service network to below the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I cannot disagree with this, but um, to build on this idea of ecosystem, what we observe from the perspective of La 27e Région, we've been ex uh, existing for 10 years, and we observe that um, developing innovation 
uh, teams and innovation initiatives within government has also created an ecosystem. What we mean by ecosystem is that there's more and more professionals and designers that are becoming specialized of inno public innovation. It's not a course, it's just a practice, and it's m a practice that is developing. We have also seen that there's more and more appetite for public innovation, so it also creates a market, a demand. Uh, we also see that if you look at the uh, innovation teams, you can see that, for example, there's no professional data analyst. Some of them are engineers, some of them are coders, etc. So it's really uh, a capacity that is inventing uh, itself. So that's why ultimately that's also something we need to uh, work on is going beyond the innovation itself. Great. Last word on this one, Perrette. Well, again, difficult to disagree. But again, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's all going to hug at the end. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, all friends. But the problem is, I think that the when uh, when the last point I was trying to make, when uh, innovation teams tend to focus on kind of these simple things or getting the behavioral nudge correct, and so you get the more tax revenue back, then you start to ignore very complex issues and complex problems because you can't. Uh, you, it's very difficult to have a measure on a uh, very single index measure on how you improved homelessness or how you tackled poverty and how you deal with dealt with these issues. So the kind of the impact measurement and the capacity that you actually to do with these kind of things is also very important. So my suggestion for the innovation labs to be effective is to have a portfolio approach, to have these big projects on the side but also demonstratable projects in the media as well. Great. Another good conversation. Thank you so much. This was tough. I know. <laughs> um, so coming back to our uh, audience participation and get those green thumbs ready. Um, Sylvine, you know, spent time arguing the case for having this innovation team that builds, brings in a dedicated capacity with skills that can actually tackle these problems differently, that um, build an ecosystem of problem solving that can build, uh, kind of start from within and build the, the, the culture change out um, and, and focus on the systems approach. Um, thumbs up if there's agreements on, on that impact. All right, <laughs> lots of thumbs. <laughs> Great. Um, and Perrette made a very compelling argument that, um, that if I th there's a cautionary tale here that if you bring in people to be innovation experts, that they have to move beyond methods, that they have to move beyond quick wins alone um, to start tackling the problems from this kind of systems change approach and thinking about solving the problems rather than solving symptoms. Um, agreements on that? Sure. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Okay, so the discussion continues and now you're going to, there are um, large sheets of paper on each of your tables up front. And you're going to partner with one or two people at your table. You're going to grab, um, everybody should take their own worksheet. And instead of discussing as a group, you're going to discuss amongst your table. Um, what did you hear today that makes you think about, um, you know, what are the current elements in innovation? Um, uh, what do you think is working, right? What, 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 based on this, who's your personal opinion on what's working? Um, and then thinking about dreaming a little bit big, imagining if you were the mayor of your city in five years, what innovation approach would you build? How would you structure your innovation capacity in your city hall? So we're going to give you um, just seven minutes. <laughs> Try to manage everybody's time. Seven minutes to talk about that as your group. Um, with your partners, and then we're going to have some of you share out. There's still some swag left from um, our Anchorage I team um, to share a, a your vision of what you would do for your city in five years, okay? So let's begin. Everybody grab your sheets and start talking. All right, everybody, finish your last thought with your neighbor. And then we're going to ask um, who wants mm -hmm. to share out their vision of... Uh, the future innovation movement in their city. So who wants to share? Remember, there's still swag at hand. Still some nifty post-it notes. I am bribing people. It works. Great. Uh, we have one uh, volunteer. Uh, do we have the mic? Where's the handheld mic? Brendan? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. He's over here. <laughs> Brendan, we'll get you extra swag. <laughs>
Yeah, that seems to be working now. It's uh, Doug's Carre from Kirklees, which is in Yorkshire, England. Um, I used to be part of an innovation team in our council, and, and it was from that that we put in a Mayor's Challenge bid and we won funding oh, from yeah. Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, what our council seems to have done since is disband that because there was a change in leadership at the, the top and various people come and go. Mm. And a lot of the ideas people went. But what they, we tried to do is do a lot of work on behaviours and expectations. So there's a different set of expectations for all staff and a different set of expectations for senior staff, which includes getting rid of red tape, working to co-produce, working in partnership, looking sideways. Um, my concern about that is I think that's really difficult to implement and enforce. It's easy to stick the poster on the wall in the office mm -hmm. and everybody will behave this way. Mm -hmm. These will be the expectations. What's difficult is to do that. And, and when you don't have a core team that's tasked with making that happen as well, mm -hmm. um, I think that's slowed down progress. So I think it was good that we tried to broaden it, but I think it's it was um, a, a mistake to dismiss the team, basically. Yeah. Because we've lost that central... We've lost the people whose day job it is to innovate. It should be everybody's job to innovate, but for some people it's helpful to have a core of people whose day job it is to say yes and to people mm -hmm. and collaborate and make things happen. Great. Anybody else? Great, over here. Yeah, absolutely. And the status quo is failure. I mean, think about it that way. And and what you know, we promote in our programs, at least, is that a failure is a important word because it disarms people, right? It puts them in an uncomfortable place, um, so that we can change the dialogue around expectations for government. I think what we also talk about, though, is testing, failing in small increments that don't have a lot of risk. So that by the time you invest in something in a big way, you've tested it and failed enough that you know that you've got the right answer, which reduces risk. But that conversation, that um, I think that's a part of government's role, is to redefine the communication protocol that's coming out of government and the way that they interact with the media, which is not easy. Um, there is a bit of a pro forma that we're used to, right? Here's the professional uh, kind of template way that we're going to handle this. The media takes it the same way, and it's this back and forth. And we need to change that dialogue, not only with the media, but with the community writ large, so that there are different expectations that we can talk more transparently, more openly um, in the ways that we see uh, private sector doing. So great examples. Uh, anyone else? Great. Well, uh, my name is Paola Antolini. I am a journalist and an anthropologist specialized mm -hmm. on innovation and research, but uh, w we, we have uh, three different uh, voices and three different views. Here we have uh, three continents, awesome. Africa, America, and Europe. So I, I would uh, give uh, first uh, the floor, but we agree on uh, something that is very important for uh, all of us. You cannot have uh, innovation without a tradition. And what is a tradition is an innovation that work well. Eh? You see, so uh, voila. So we we have uh, this uh, same uh, idea that uh, innovating is uh, blooming together eh, mm. in different ways. So if you have uh, not roots, if you don't uh, have uh, your tradition, you cannot have a flower. Now, different view eh, right. from North America. Oh. No, it, it was interesting that that's. The conversation that we had almost immediately went there about um, while we innovate and while we look for different solutions to problems that we're, we're facing to make sure that we're still meeting people where they are and really relying on um, culturally appropriate innovations that people have an easier time accepting and working with and making part of their daily life. So and the way you summed it up was just perfect. You know, I love that. 
uh, tradition as an innovation that worked. Great. Yes, my, uh, my name is Robert Akiza, and uh, I work with a very small uh, local organization, in, uh, it's a refugee-led organization in Kampala, Uganda. Yes, as my colleagues say, we've been discussing a little bit here about innovation, and uh, we uh, agree that really, because we innovate for the people, and uh, we thought that uh, it's really very important that in whatever ways we involve the people that uh, we want to uh, innovate uh, for. So uh, their involvement is very, very important because uh, we believe that people have ideas and they have great ideas, and uh, if we involve them, uh, they will feel more comfortable and uh, bring out those ideas and uh, uh, which are going to be good to change the situation and the challenges people are facing. Great, yeah. thank you. Anyone else? Great. any of the cities we're working with, um, it feels like, um, you know, we're struggling here with health, education, very on the ground, riverfront redevelopment projects like that. So when we pitched this, we've literally had uh, a response rate of two sign up among eight cities that we pitched to. Um, for them, it just, you know, I think that's our struggle. How do we make, because if 20 years from or 25 years from now, we need to be thinking about uh, solutions that are going to affect our cities then, given our rate of uh, growth, how do we start thinking about that and innovating the way we do things today versus solving for the immediate issues mm -hmm. on the ground? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we'd love to hear from, we've, I've been talking to Monica here on how Copenhagen thought about it or other cities thought about it. How do we kind of make this a burning platform? I think is really our struggle. Corporate biological systems. Um, well, we had a good discussion on uh, innovation, that why we think it doesn't really is a good term. But I would like to pick up on uh, tradition is an innovation that worked. Uh, we tend to look at large uh, cities, but also smaller villages as an, uh, biological organisms. Mm. And that, that helps us framing a lot of technical issues uh, because nature is very successful um, it's a wonderful tradition and and maybe uh, the, over the last two days i i thought we might think more about uh, cities as biological organisms mm. and then we are just participants that's great um, and there's actually a whole field in design called biomimicry of looking to nature and the way that animals insects ecosystems adapt and interact as a way to solve problems um, in, in our real world, in our human uh, world of cities. So that's, that's a great comment. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> sure. No quick wins here. Um, and I, I want to thank you all for this really interesting debate. I know it's, um, I don't know, I find it frustrating sometimes in these kinds of um, interactions. We don't get a lot of time to talk and dive deep. Um, but I think it was a great conversation that we can continue to have throughout the rest of the, uh, the conference today and certainly beyond. Um, you know, and, and it seems just to kind of sum up what we've heard a lot of different things, um, that it's, it's as you're building a, an innovation capacity or, or redesigning your innovation capacity, thinking of the what. What is it that we want to really accomplish and how do we want to accomplish it? Where do we put it in the organization? How do we start? Um, when, you know, who, who is involved? Uh, do we start with kind of everybody needs to be doing this at the same time, or do we start with a concentrated few mm -hmm. that help build a uh, systems approach from within? Um, and, and how do they do it? What methods and tools are they using? Um, how are they learning along the way, teaching along the way, adapting along the way, pushing themselves beyond um, the basic innovation, getting to more of the transformational change that I think we're all eager for in government? Um, so there's a lot of questions that we don't all have the answers to. And um, please feel free to stay and continue the conversation today and, and beyond. And, and thank you to our panelists um, for doing a great mm -hmm. job. And, and thank you to you all. Thank you.